Good morning, and welcome to Randy School's virtual capstone presentation series. These seniors have worked exceptionally hard all year to research their topics in order to produce a sizable written project, as well as the presentation you are about to see. As a reminder, the presenter can't see your comments in the chat in real time, but I can. So at any point during the presentation, you can post questions or comments. At the end of the presentation, I'll ask for questions to be submitted in the chat, and I'll pick some of those out to ask our presenter. Epilepsy is not an unknown condition, but most people who do not have a personal connection to the disorder have no significant base of knowledge about it. Nellie used her capstone to attempt to change that. In addition to her goal of educating the community about epilepsy, Nellie also interviewed relatives of those with the disorder in order to better understand their struggles and triumphs in aiding those in their lives who live with the condition. All of this informs the presentation you are about to see. Nellie, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? I'm great. Are you ready to go? Yes. All right. So now uh, here is Nellie Fadil exploring what you don't know about epilepsy. Hi, everyone. Today I'll be talking to you about what you don't know about epilepsy. I chose this topic because it's something that is part of my personal life, given my twin brother is epileptic. Now, of course, I've done my research, but I'm also speaking from experience. I've always been alert and prepared to deal with my brother's seizures, and having parents that are both practicing physicians helped me feel secure and confident that my brother would always be okay. I always wondered about how other families in our community dealt with epilepsy disorders in, way I, in ways I didn't. My goal is not only to discuss current implications, both negative and positive, of epilepsy and its impact on these families, but hopefully take a step towards finding a solution to the surrounding stigma and finding a cure. Uh, I don't know how to fix that. Are you sure? Okay. So let's start with the basics. Epilepsy disorder, one of the most common neurological disorders, affects one in every 26 people worldwide, or 65 million people and counting. For a person to be diagnosed with epilepsy, they need to sustain two unprovoked seizure occurrences. Seizures are sudden, uncontrolled electrical disturbances in the brain that can be caused by trauma, infection, or even genetics. When it comes to classifying seizures, there are two main groups, partial seizures and generalized seizures. From there, each of the two can be broken down depending on the patient's level of consciousness during the seizure itself. Consciousness can be described by neurologists as the ability to respond and remember. There are three levels of consciousness, preserved, partial, or lost. Patients can cycle through different levels of consciousness between each seizure and sometimes even during one episode. For example, a patient might be fully conscious at the beginning of a seizure, but could lose consciousness partially or fully during the seizure. More than half of those diagnosed with epilepsy sustain partial or focal seizures, while only 30% sustain generalized. Generalized seizures happen across both sides of the brain. They can be separated into six types, absence, myoclonic, atonic, tonic, clonic, and finally, grand mal seizures. The two most well-known types are absence or petit mal seizures and grand mal seizures, with petit mal seizures, the seizure itself tends to occur without warning and leaves the patient partially responsive or conscious. Characteristics include staring as if the patient is zoning out, small muscle, small muscle movements such as twitching of the hands and the mouth, and following the absence seizure, the patient might be able to resume whatever they were doing without hesitation. Grand mal seizures, on the other hand, have some tells such as auras, certain smells or feelings, and leaves the patient completely unconscious and unresponsive to their surroundings. Certain characteristics include stiffening of the body, muscle jerks, or a sudden collapse of the floor. Following a grand mal seizure, the patient experiences long periods of fatigue and usually falls asleep. Now, unlike generalized seizures, partial or focal seizures occur in specific areas of the brain. Partial seizures can be broken down into three types, simple, complex, and secondary generalized. 
Simple focal seizures are motor seizures impacting the patient's limbs, causing weakness or stiffness, while complex seizures are verbal seizures, causing vocalizations such as repetition of words, repetition of words, grunts, or laughing, and sometimes sudden screams, but can incorporate involuntary motor functions such as tapping, picking, or stumbling. Finally, secondary generalized seizures show the same characteristics as grand mal seizures, but originate from one side of the brain and then migrate to the other. Patients who experience these types of seizures are at high risk of memory loss and brain injury. Now, you might think the seizure itself is the only important part to keep note of. This cannot be further from the truth. The period following a seizure, the postictal period, is a time of decreased consciousness during which the patient becomes quiet and breathing resumes. The patient gradually awakens and is usually confused. Headache and muscular pain are common and the patient does not recall the seizure itself. Other characteristics include weakness of the limbs, speech impairment, and aggression. With all this in mind, it's obvious that there's room for misdiagnosis. So how does the doctor screen and diagnose the patient with epilepsy? The first and most common is an EEG. This screening device is used to collect brainwave activity from the brain's surface by hooking up electrodes to the patient's scalp. EEGs can be used to locate lesions in the brain that could be causing seizures, as well as monitor seizure reoccurrences and patterns. As you see in the, the photo here, the top is a picture of normal brain waves when read on the EEG. The second is what brain waves look like during partial seizures. And the third is what brain waves look like during general seizures. Take note of how aggressive the brain waves are compared to normal brain waves. A different type of screening is the functional MRI. Unlike EEG, this screening is mostly used for research purposes to understand causes of seizures and possible treatments and are rarely used in clinical settings like an EEG. A study was done by the Department of Neurology in Germany used using an fMRI on 166 patients during their first seizure occurrence and found that 26% of seizures were due to brain lesions, 12 were due to tumors, and 5% or from traumatic scar formations. In the photo here, I'll quickly describe the different viewpoints um, of the MRI scans. The sagittal view is as if the person was cut in half and was being looked at from the side. The transverse view as was, is shown as if the person's head was cut perpendicular to their body, looking from a bird's eye view. And the coronal view is as if they were cut from behind and you're looking at the back of their head. Now, regardless of how the seizure originates, there are ways seizure occurrences can be aggravated. The first and most common mistake those with epilepsy make is forgetting to take their medication. This is, the most, this is more dangerous than taking an extra dose of their medication. The next is sleep deprivation. It is recommended for everyone to have seven to eight hours of sleep. The, next, the sleep-wake cycle plays a key role in electrical, chemical, and hormonal regulation in the brain making it common to see seizures as, trans as one transitions in and out of sleep. Stress is another common factor. Now, when you're stressed, your cortisol levels increase. Your brain enters that fight or flight mode and sends out electrical impulses that negatively affect parts of the brain that control cognitive behavior, emotions, and memory. Stress-induced panic attacks or increased hyperventilation, for example, can provoke absence seizures. The next and most commonly known due to media is photosensitivity. This occurs when a patient is exposed to flashing lights or rapid movements. About 3% of people with epilepsy usually grow out of it with age. Some specific triggers include strobe, light, strobe lights, television screens, video games, and visual patterns such as stripes and contrasting colors. Finally, a rare but important factor that could aggravate seizures is hypo or hyperglycemia. Clinical Clinical studies show that those with hyper or hypoglycemia have an increased risk of experiencing seizures. Other experimental studies suggest that a threshold glucose concentration is necessary to support synaptic transmission. 
Besides controlling the stressful environments the patient lives in and being cautious about their health, how can they treat their epilepsy significantly? There are three common routes of treatment. The first and most common is medicating, followed by dietary changes, and finally surgery. Now, before we get into how anti-epileptic drugs or AEDs work in the brain, we need to understand what those drugs are doing and where. The goal is simple. The normal activity you see in the diagram above is what doctors want to see. And the abnormal activity at, on the bottom here is what the, is, is the issue. So this so-called abnormal activity between brain cells, sorry. Um, so this, this so-called abnormal activity occurs between brain cells. Brain cells or neurons work by sending impulses from one cell to another, pre to post synapse, to transfer messages or action potential around the brain and the body. Therefore, brain cells work to communicate using electrical signals, when they, and when they do this, they give off electrical activity, or brain waves, which is picked up on the EEG. During seizure activity, those electrical signals, or brain waves, are amplified and neurons fire signals in excess. Now that we know how neurons work and communicate, how do AEDs control the excess firing in the brain? There are many ways, but the most common ways are targeting sodium and calcium channels. As you can see here, uh, carmazepine, a well-known AED, works by slowly turning off the sodium channel within the brain from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. Another common anti-epileptic drug, gabapentin, works by inhibiting calcium channel through the brain from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. As helpful as medication can be, there needs to be a trial phase. The trial phase can last from a couple of weeks to a few months. During this phase, the patient may experience adverse effects such as dizziness, rash, or seizure aggravation. Depending on the severity of these adverse effects, the neurologist will determine whether or not the patient should continue on their medication. Sometimes adverse effects do not appear until many months or even years later. Unfortunately, when they do appear, they can be more severe, causing issues such as decreased concentration, memory, coordination, rash, a drop in white blood cell, and liver failure. These are just a few of the many possible outcomes from taking AEDs, and certain side effects vary depending on the variety, depending on the type of AED the patient is prescribed. The ketogenic diet is one possible solution to dealing with AEDs and their adverse effects. This is a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet consisting of seafood, low-carb vegetables, healthy fats, and healthy fats like avocados. A clinical trial at the Great Ormond Street Hospital in 2008 and other studies since then have shown that the diet significantly reduced the number of seizures and a proportion of children whose seizures did not respond well to AEDs. After three months, around four in 10 children who started the diet had their number of seizures reduced by over half and were able to reduce their medication. If AEDs stop working and diets no longer have any impact in improving the patient's seizures, surgery is another treatment option for those with epilepsy. Moreover, severe cases of epilepsy can, that can damage the brain make surgery more appealing. There are many types of procedures that can be done to treat epilepsy, and we can be here for days talking about them. But three well-known surgeries include the hemispherectomy, the corpus callostomy, and thermal ablation. The hemispherectomy, hemispherectomy, probably the most dated high-risk operation for epilepsy, consists of removing half of the brain's cortex and leaves the patient without many of their abilities for many months and requires a lot of rehabilitation. The corpus callostomy, next is the corpus callostomy. The corpus callosum is an area of nerve fibers within the brain that link the left and right hemispheres. In many cases, this part of the brain amplifies seizures across the brain region, and if severed, the electrical activity can be contained in one hemisphere, therefore diminishing seizures. Even though it is less invasive than the hemispherectomy, 
It still requires surgeons to open up the skull and cut through brain tissue. The final and least invasive and most recent form of surgery is thermal ablation or laser interstitial thermal therapy. This procedure consists of heating up targeted regions in the brain and essentially killing those brain cells. The video I have here will further explain the procedure itself and explain the higher level of success rate. Around four months old, Justin started having periods of time where he stopped breathing. His lips would turn blue and he'd kind of get a little gray. When Justin was just a few months old, he came in with seizures and what turned out to be a tumor that was right in this area, which I took out when he was an infant. He's done very well with that, but in the past year or so, it started to have a lot of seizures that have not been responding well to medications. He would be on a medicine for a while, it would seem to be working, and then he'd start having seizures again. The neurologist said that usually after three or four medicines, when you fail, that's when they start talking about other options, and one of them would be surgery. Dr. Madsen actually gave us two options when we met with him. The first was a craniotomy with Justin awake. And I said, isn't there anything else that we can do? I don't want to open up his head again. And he said, well, you know, actually there is something new that's being done and I think it might work. This procedure we'll do today, we don't actually open up and see the brain at all directly with our eyes. Uh, we will pass a probe into this area from back here, kind of along the axis. Once we get the coordinates of where we want the tip of our laser to be, the head frame with those big wings and sliders that you see will be what actually directs our passage of the laser right into this lesion. We will ablate it by heating it up. There's a, a diode laser that will heat the tissue up in a, in a very specific place so that the cells die in an area that we can prescribe. There's really two critically important advances in technology which have allowed this kind of uh, therapy to be done. One is the ability to use MRI studies to very precisely plan and direct uh, our treatment. And we have the advantage here of being actually in an MRI scanner room, which is also an operating room. The other technology is the ability to use the MRI signal to detect temperature in the brain. And this was a very important discovery that has made it possible to safely, literally, turn on a laser inside the human brain. Okay, if you watch this one now, we'll put some yellow here. A centimeter and a half. This is the, the new damage, and this is the current temperature. In this picture, you can see that there's three epicenters, one, two, three, which is the shape that we wanted to get. I'm very happy with this, and I would say he has an 80 to 90 percent chance of having his seizures controlled now. Justin's recovery was amazing. We were discharged at noon the day after surgery, and by the time we got home, Justin already wanted to go down the road and play and be out and doing things, and I think the hardest part of the recovery for me was holding him back a little bit because, you know, he, he feels fine. Three weeks post-surgery now and he has not had any seizures since we've been home. I knew we made the right choice. Now let's take a step back. We understand what epilepsy is, how it's diagnosed, and how it can be treated. But we need to realize that this is a human being, just like you and me, and we can't load them up with anti-epileptic drugs and cut and remove pieces of their brain aimlessly. Everyone involved, the doctor, the patient, and the family, needs to have a certain level of confidence in order to get the best out of the diagnosis process and treatment plan. That takes us into the psychosocial impact. There are many factors that impact the family dynamics among those with epilepsy. The most, the most important is taught stigma. A study done by the University of Cincinnati alongside the Pediatric Neurology Associates of the US demonstrated that stigma within the family is responsible for triggering some of the behavioral problems in people with epilepsy. 
It, is further, it was further determined that fear, individual isolation, secrecy, and concealment were negative strategies often used by people with epilepsy and fem family members in the course of their interactions. Unfortunately, this has had deleterious effects of heightening the feelings of depression, emotional immaturity, and poor social skills among those with epilepsy. The next is classroom dynamic. Like family dynamics, the classroom dynamic also has many key factors that impact those with epilepsy. The most important is the teacher's confidence and the resources given to them. A study done in the UK surveying 149 school teachers from 12 mainstream schools found that they were given proper information about epilepsy, but lacked confidence in training and application. A well-known program to help improve this issue is the School Alert Program developed by the Epilepsy Foundation of America. Their program guides classroom teachers, students, and school nurses in obtaining information about epilepsy and, and its application. It covers ways to recognize a seizure, emergency medical training for nurses, classroom management, and destigmatization de for students. So what can I do? With all of this information, so what can I do with all this information and research? Why did I spend all year and really all my life learning about epilepsy? I want to understand the personal aspects and hear families who want to be heard. I set up interviews with families in our community who just like myself have loved ones diagnosed with epilepsy or even have it themselves. The main focus is on epilepsy's impact on those encountering it rather than those who undergo seizures, like the patient's family. I, focus, I developed questions around the following topics shown here, demographics, family dynamic among the patient, the parents, and the siblings, and how they react to public during emergency situations. Due to patient privacy, I had all my interviewees give me full consent to share their medical and personal history without identification. Each interview was constructed off interview questions based on topics shown here, and each session took 45 minutes to an hour to conduct. I surveyed a number of families who have loved ones from as young to six years old to 30 years old who are diagnosed with epilepsy. The certain trends presented themselves as follows. Overall, the parent's reaction to their child's diagnosis was positive. However, initially there could be room for tension among family members. In some cases, it was because the parents could not grant their, ch their child certain privileges, such as taking away driving privileges if their child wasn't seizure free for six months to a year, making it illegal for them to drive. Another interesting approach is when parents take a more reserved approach to their child. They still went out of their way to attain the best treatments and doctors for their child, but sheltered their children and refrained from discussing the issue with loved ones and those who aren't directly helping them. Next, how siblings reacted to, the, to their how siblings reacted to their loved one's diagnosis depended on their relationship. If the sibling is close to the patient, they react well and are very helpful in times of need. However, there can be a sense of jealousy because of the diverted attention or even sense of estrangement. The other trend was the reaction due to the sibling's age. The younger sibling, the younger the sibling, the more likely they will be embarrassed about their child's disorder, their sibling's disorder. Sorry. The interview showed that those siblings grew out of that feeling of embarrassment and have become advocates for their siblings. In terms of the patient's reaction, it was mainly based on their level of fear. Epilepsy, as much as it can be controlled, there's always a fear of having an unexpected seizure. Moreover, the anxiety paired with that possibility, especially in public, was expressed by multiple families. Overall, the patients I interviewed found ways to accept their disorder. A specific example is one patient felt that his medication slowed him down and it frustrated him, so he stopped taking his medication and had a seizure because of it which led to self-disappointment, but also self-growth. On a more external level, when it comes to emergencies and public situations, the families I interviewed reacted similarly dealing with people. They all focused on their loved ones and act quickly without worrying. Given the patient is having the seizure, there's only so much they can do and control. 
Usually it's in the hands of their child or sibling to react either before or after the seizure. The most common issue is the public's response, especially when calling an ambulance. Multiple patients and families stated that they never enjoyed dealing with having with either waking up in the hospital or being in the hospital with a bill hanging over their heads. A few expectations outlined by families interviewed included a certain level of respect and kindness, especially when there's a lack of knowledge on how to handle a situation. Understanding when it's an actual emergency and not categorizing seizures as a constant emergency, drawing attention to the lack of services and resources after a certain age those with epilepsy or disabilities do not have, and finally, the concept that patients aren't defined by their disorder or disease and are humans like the rest of us, and they deserve the same level of care and affection. It was insightful to hear and learn from my interviewees and how they reacted to their loved one's disorder. As much as I can tell you, hearing it in their own words is important as well. So I will be sharing with you a series of quotes taken from my interviews to show you those positive and negative experiences. Engaging in social activities outside of our immediate family and friends is fraught with tension and worry as people stare at my daughter and are almost afraid of her. It causes a lot of stress between myself and my husband. When my daughter is being particularly difficult, it can cause big arguments. I feel lucky to have epilepsy because I'm able to help others who are having seizures in public. It has educated me. It has made me kinder towards others. You have no idea what people carry with them, so it's important to be humane and kind with one another. I feel like I had a responsibility to make something of myself because I've seen someone like my sister lose that opportunity. Those with epilepsy disorder aren't defined by their disorder or disease. Everyone has their own healing process and way of healing that is different from everyone, everyone else's, and that needs patience and understanding. So how about the stigma that my interviewees reflected? How do we correct it? By educating and empowering people. So how can you help? How can we as a community be prepared to help if we witness someone having a seizure in public? You're already familiar with how it happens and its implications, but it depends on the circumstances. Therefore, the approach might change. If there's nothing you can do directly, focus on, focus on crowd control to avoid embarrassment and allow space for the person seizing and room for emergency responders to assist. But there are basics you and I can learn just in case we're asked to help. The most common and most important is the rescue position. The most common misconception is to have the seizing person lay down on their back or front, sitting upright or tilted. They need to be lying down on their side with their head protected to avoid hitting hard objects. Try to, position, try to position him or her on their side so that any saliva or vomit can leak out of their mouth rather than being swallowed or going down the windpipe. Make sure they are unrestrained to avoid breaking of bones, muscle tears, or bruising. Make sure to loosen all tight clothing and remove any objects they could have been holding. With the person lying down, kneel on the floor at their side, as seen in, st in stage one. Extend the arm nearest to you at a right angle to the body with their palm facing up. Take the other arm, as seen in stage two, fold it so that the back of their head, the back of their hand rests on their cheek closest to you and hold it in place. Use your free hand to bend the person's knee, the person's knee furthest from you, farthest from you, to a right angle, as seen in stage three. In stage four, carefully roll the person onto their side by pulling on the knee. Their bent arm should be supporting the head, and their extended arm will stop you from rolling too far. Open their airway by gently tilting their head back and lifting their chin and check that nothing is blocking their airway. And finally, stay with the person and monitor their condition until help arrives. Should you call 911? If you do, it's not a problem, especially if no one's around. If you notice that they're being helped by someone, approach them first and ask if you should call for an ambulance. An important thing to monitor is how long the seizure lasts. If it asks longer than two minutes, you must call an ambulance. Those diagnosed with epilepsy do not need to go to the hospital and should recover with ease as long as there were not, no major injuries. It is only necessary to call in the following circumstances. The seizure lasts longer than two to five minutes. 
The person has several seizures back to back. The person had difficulty breathing or is injured. And if the patient remains unconscious, drowsy, or aggravated for longer than 15 minutes. I want to thank you guys all for listening, and I hope you take this knowledge and apply it if it ever becomes necessary. Thank you. There you are. There you are. Hey, Nelly, congratulations and well done. Uh, hold on a second. There you are. Yep. Keep cutting in and out there on the video. So uh, I'm hoping if you uh, if you just end, just stop sharing your screen. I'm hoping that it'll pop back. Yeah, let me. There we go. Yep, there you are. Okay. So, <laughs> um, well done. Uh, there's a bunch of questions in the chat already, and if anybody hasn't already posted a question that they wanted to ask, you can go ahead and do so now. Uh, let me go ahead and just start asking some. So, do uh, Dr. Lutz asks, what's the most important thing you learned about epilepsy that you didn't know before? And what is one takeaway you want viewers to remember from your presentation? So... I mean, having a brother with epilepsy, I always knew that um, there were other people who were affected by it, but I didn't realize how how much stigma surrounded it. I think a lot of us know that there's stigma around issues such as learning disabilities and uh, physical disabilities, things of that nature, but not so much neurological disorders. Um, and it affected a lot more people than we realize. Um, so I think the main takeaway is just being conscious of that and working towards uh, being aware and being able to help. Okay, great. Uh, John wants to know, uh, what are your thoughts on, or did you come across this at all, uh, real-time seizure detection algorithms within like a brain-computer interface, so essentially having some sort of, uh, uh, I guess, hardware installed that would help detect when seizures are happening and try to counteract them. Did that come that up did, in your research at all? That never came across in my research, although there was something similar to that nature. It's called um, a vagus nerve implant, mm -hmm. um, and that can help um, control your current uh, electrical impulses. But uh, I never came across anything with, like, brain implants. Okay. Uh, Olivia wants to know, is it possible for a seizure to go undetected? And if so, how can this affect the severity of later seizures? Yes. So... One of the seizures I focused on, the pitti mal seizures, it's a generalized seizure. Mm -hmm. um, my brother actually used to have them when he was younger. We never used to realize when he was having them because it's just as if the patient is zoning out. Right. So if a person has these types of seizures and they go undiagnosed, it could cause a lot of damage to the person and uh, both academically and medically. Okay. Uh, Trent says, uh, great job, first of all. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and then how did the research for epilepsy help you understand what components can be affected in your brother uh, and others? And, uh, and did your parents help you understand the topic before you even started the research process? So I definitely knew a fair amount. Like I had a general foundation, but I think just throughout the year I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and my, as I went through it with my mom, as I was writing this um, paper, we both learned a lot as well. There were things we did with my brother, for example, that we could have done better. And that goes uh, for even other families that when I interviewed them, they were like, oh, we didn't know that. So it's a very specialized topic. And because it's so detailed and vast, I feel like I can never stop learning about it. Uh, Ash would like to know uh, if you know how much the surgery costs and is it affordable for, for people? So I actually did come across this in my research and I found that a lot of families don't go through with the surgery because of how, uh, how expensive it can be, mm -hmm. especially since epilepsy can be seen as with like certain demographics um, and how those demographics correlate with certain socioeconomic standpoints. Hmm. Um, it's not something that I have in front of me right now, but it's in my research paper mentioned. Okay. Uh, Dr. Martin asks if uh, epilepsy has, since epilepsy has lifelong effects for people who suffer from it, like driving privileges, for example, uh, how can organizations and communities help support people who have epilepsy that can be controlled? It really is empowering them. There, there are a lot of statistics showing that, especially in the workforce, there's a lot of stigma 
if you put epilepsy on your resume, for example. These people might have controlled seizures be on medication and be going in for a desk job. And if their employer sees that they have epilepsy, they'll turn them down, mm-hmm. even though they, they don't really cause a threat to the business. Right. So it's really just being more accepting and being more empowering of the disorder. Okay. Uh, Brian says, great job. Uh, would you say that it's safe for a person with epilepsy to do activities such as swimming or diving? Or driving, sorry. It depends on the epilepsy, the type of uh, seizure they have. Um, how controlled it is, and the extent. Um, Of course, with driving, for example, there are legal bounds you need to follow. You need to be seizure-free for six months to a year, Mm -hmm. and that goes for scuba diving as well. Um, But swimming and um, other recreational activities, as long as they know their limits and there are people around them that can help, it shouldn't be an issue. Okay. Uh, Ms. Sorrell says, uh, wonderful job, Nellie. Uh, How do you believe schools can be better equipped to respond and support those with epilepsy? So uh, there was an instance in our community where a child had a seizure and the faculty had the child laying down on their, I believe it was either their back or their stomach. And there were students saying, hey, you need to have them on their side. And the teachers did not listen. I think the most important thing is to be well-educated. If teachers go out of their way to be educated about um, dealing with epilepsy, especially if they know from the medical records that parents provide to the school, if there's just even that small misconception could save someone's life during that um, event and prevent a a whole... uh, a whole issue with sending the child to the hospital and students panicking and Mm -hmm. absolutely um so just general like education on that front would be right and and, and application as well because they go hand in hand because you can know so much but when it comes when the time comes you might not know how to apply it sure like we practice with aeds and cpr and all of that which is something that we can do right um, I think we have one more question uh, from Dr. Spencer. Uh, since seizures don't often happen in front of medical personnel, what symptoms are important for bystanders to report to doctors to help in diagnosis? So not so much what even we should be looking out for, but what are certain things that whenever, you know, the EMS or, or the, you know, you're reporting what you've seen, what sorts of things are most important for uh, medical professionals to know about? Um, definitely. So, um, I have instances where I'm in public with my brother alone and he goes into a seizure and people ask me those questions while I'm dealing with him. And I'll ha- even though it can be disruptive, it's fine. Like I understand it. They're just trying to help. I tell them, give me the time so that I can tell um, my mom, for example, how long the seizure lasted. That's important. Keep note of how long it lasts. And if they sustained any injuries, if they fell, um, uh, any signs of aggravation and the other would be, um, what were they doing before the seizure happened? Mm-hmm. Those types of behaviors. Okay. Did they oh, seem spacey? Stuff like that. Okay. So the general circumstances just prior to the seizure, how long the seizure is lasting, and did they hurt themselves in any way during or after the seizure? Or yes. Uh, as a result, like any additional complications. And if, if um, another important one is if they were to vomit or there was excess saliva, um, if they choked on it. Okay. Be sure to mention that for sure because it could cause lung information. Okay. Uh, it looks like there's one last question um, from Nicholas. Uh, what are some side effects of some epilepsy medications? You described a story where one man did not take his medication because it was slowing him down. Uh, are there are those, is that the most common? Are there other side effects that you read about? Um, there are many, many lists of side effects and many, many drugs um, epileptic people can take. And actually, um, those with epilepsy can be on up to three or four drugs at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, So this opens up a whole nother door of um, (laughs) different uh, side effects. But most common are fatigue, seizure aggravation, actually, Mm -hmm. um, aggression, uh, uh, more sleep or insomnia things of that nature. Um, and of course you don't want to be feeling symptoms of depression or feel slow or, um, angry all the time. So 
you if it doesn't make you feel well, you stop taking the medication, and then you're you're putting yourself at risk. And maybe try something different. As you said, there's there's so many different medications out there. Exactly. It might just be exactly. an issue of getting the right ones. And um, that's why it's important to be able to have that open conversation with the neurologist and with your family members. Sure. Uh, all, uh, one follow-up on a question from before from Alden. Why, did, why is it important to track the length of a seizure? So most seizures, especially with those with epilepsy, usually last, last between uh, a few seconds mm -hmm. to roughly two, two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. If it goes longer than that, it's unusual and there's something wrong that's happening within the brain that needs to be monitored uh, as soon as possible and dealt with. Um, and depending on the type of seizure they're having, it could cause brain injury. Mm -hmm. And that just, we don't want that. <laughs> right. And, and just for point of clarification for anybody watching, uh, do you plan on following uh, this research you know, when you go to college? Is this something that you're interested in continuing to learn about? Yes. So I've always wanted to help my brother, um, regardless of what uh, career path I chose, but I finally settled on going into neurology and hopefully um, going to med school and maybe finding something that could help my brother and others with epilepsy. That's really nice to hear. Uh, Nellie, congratulations. You've completed Capstone and with it, your writing school education. So well done. It was a great presentation. Uh, for anybody uh, in the audience that's looking to watch the uh, remaining Capstone presentations, uh, their next one will be in a little over an hour at 1230. It'll be Summer Abloveri uh, teaching us about uh, the efficacy of women in politics and leadership positions. Um, I hope you'll join us for that. And then our last one is at two o'clock uh, today. Uh, have a wonderful day.